Hello and welcome to a cozy Christmas podcast. My name is Art, and we're about ready to start season three. Now, officially, I'm not. I'm going to start the season next week. So, in the meantime, I wanted to give you a special bonus episode. Today, I'll be reading the story "Doctor Marigold," written by Charles Dickens in 1865. And this is the story I'll be reading for this month's Cozy Christmas Reading Challenge. Uh, and the challenge, again, is to read a story or book that has to do with family. The full title is Dr. Marigold's Prescriptions. Dr. Marigold is what's called a cheap jack. And basically, that is someone who, who sells stuff, who sells not really junk, but kind of think of them as like a traveling thrift store and lives by his wits and by his skill at talking and convincing people to buy things. It is a story with tragedy. It has to do a bit with abuse and neglect, but at its heart is the beautiful story of a father who loves his daughter, though she has some disabilities. Now, the topic of disability is rare in Victorian literature, and not always handled well. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll admit that. I think Dickens does about as well as anyone could at this time, though this story is not perfect, but it, it does reflect some of the society's uh, views of, of uh, the disabled. It's a pretty dark story at times. Dickens has a message he wants to make as well. I have a lot I want to say about this story, but I'm going to wait until the next episode. For right now, I just want to read to you the story so that you can enjoy it. It's some of the most powerful writing that Dickens, I think, has ever done. So sit back and relax and enjoy Dr. Marigold's Prescriptions. I am a cheap jack and my own father's name was Willem Marigold. It was in his lifetime supposed by some that his name was William, but my father always consistently said, No, it was Willem. On which point I content myself with looking at the argument this way. If a man is not allowed to know his own name in a free country, how much is he allowed to know in a land of slavery? As to looking at the argument through the medium of the register, Willem Marigold come into the world before registers come up much and went out of it too. They wouldn't have been greatly in his line neither, if they had chance to come up before him. I was born on the Queen's Highway, but it was the King's at that time. A doctor was fetched to my own mother by my own father when it took place on a common, and in consequence of his being a very kind gentleman, and accepting no fee but a tea tray, I was named Doctor, out of gratitude and compliment to him. There you have me, Dr. Marigold. I am at present a middle-aged man of broadish build, in cords, leggings, and a sleeved waistcoat, the strings of which is always gone behind. Repair them how you will, they go like fiddle strings. You have been to the theater, and you have seen one of the violin players screw up his violin after listening to it as if it had been whispering the secret to him that it feared it was out of order, and then you have heard it snap. That's as exactly similar to my waistcoat as a waistcoat and a violin can be like one another. I am partial to a white hat, and I like a shawl around my neck, wore loose and easy. Sitting down is my favorite posture. If I have a taste in point of personal jewelry, it is mother of pearl buttons. There you have me again, as large as life. The doctor having accepted a tea tray, you'll guess that my father was a cheap jack before me. You are right. He was. It was a pretty tray. It represented a large lady going along a serpentine uphill gravel walk to attend a little church. Two swans had likewise come astray with the same intentions. When I call her a large lady, I don't mean in point of breadth, for there she fell below my views, but she more than made it up in height. Her height and slimness was, in short, the height of both. I often saw that tray, after I was the innocently smiling cause, or more likely screeching one, of the doctor standing it up on a table against the wall in his consulting room, Whenever my own father and mother were in that part of the country, I used to put my head, I have heard my own mother say it was flaxen curls at that time, though you wouldn't know an old 
hearth broom from it now till you come to the handle and found it wasn't me, and at the doctor's door, and the doctor was always glad to see me and said, Aha, my brother practitioner, come in, little M.D., how are your inclinations as to sixpence? You can't go on forever, you'll find, nor yet could my father, nor yet my mother. If you don't go off as whole when you are about to do, you're liable to go off in part, and two to one your heads depart. Gradually my father went off his, and my mother went off hers. It was in a harmless way, but it put out the family where I boarded them. The old couple, though retired, got to be wholly and solely devoted to the cheap jack business, and were always selling the family off. Whenever the cloth was laid for dinner, my father began rattling the plates and dishes, as we do in our line when we put up crockery for a bid, only he had lost the trick of it, and mostly let them drop and broke them. As the old lady had been used to sit in the cart, and had the articles out one by one to the old gentleman on the footboard to sell, just in the same way she handed him every item of the family's property, and they disposed of it in their own imaginations from morning to night. At last the old gentleman, lying bedridden in the same room with the old lady, cries out in the old patter, fluent, after having been silent for two days and nights, Now here, my jolly companions, every one, which the Nightingale Club in a village was held at the sign of the Cabbage and Shears, where the singers, no doubt, would have greatly excelled, but for want of taste, voices, and ears. Now here, my jolly companions, every one, is a working model of a used-up old cheap jack, without a tooth in his head, and with a pain in every bone, so like life that it would be just as good if it wasn't better, just as bad if it wasn't worse, and just as new if it wasn't worn out. Bid for the working model of the old cheap jack, who has drunk more gunpowder tea with the ladies in his time than would blow the lid off a washerwoman's copper, and carried as many thousands of miles higher than the moon as not nicks not. Divided by the national debt, carry nothing to the poor rates, three under and two over. Now, my hearts of oak and men of straw, what do you say for the lot? Two shillings, a shilling, ten pence, eight pence, six pence, four pence, two pence? Who said two pence? The gentleman in the scarecrow's hat? I am ashamed of the gentleman in the scarecrow's hat. I really am ashamed of him for his want of public spirit. Now I'll tell you what I'll do with you. Come, I'll throw you in a working model of an old woman that was married to the old cheap Jack so long ago that upon my word and honor it took place in Noah's Ark before the unicorn could get in to forbid the bounds by blowing a tune upon his horn. There now, come, what do you say for both? I'll tell you what I'll do with you. I don't bear you malice for being so backward. Here, if you make me a bid that'll only reflect a little credit on your town, I'll throw you in a warming pan for nothing and lend you a toasting fork for life. Now come, what do you say after that splendid offer? Say two pounds, say thirty shillings, say a pound, say ten shillings, say five, say two and six. You don't say even two and six? You say two and three? No, you shan't have the lot for two and three. I'd sooner give it to you if you was good looking enough. Here, missus, chuck the old man and woman into the cart, put the horse to and drive him away and bury him. Such were the last words of Willem Marigold, my own father, and they were carried out by him and by his wife, my own mother, on one and the same day, as I ought to know, having followed as mourner. My father had been a lovely one in his time at the cheap jack work, as his dying observations went to prove, but I top him. I don't say it because it's myself, but because it has been universally acknowledged by all that has had the means of comparison. I have worked at it, I have measured myself against other public speakers, members of parliament, platforms, pulpits, council, learned in the law, and where I have found them good, I have took a bit of imagination from them, and where I have found them bad, I have let them alone. Now I'll tell you what, I mean to go down into my grave declaring that of all the callings ill used in Great Britain, the cheap jack calling is the worst used. Why ain't we a profession? Why ain't we endowed with privileges? Why are we forced to take out a hawker's license when no such thing is expected of the political hawkers? Where's the difference betwixt us? Except that we are cheap jacks, and they are dear jacks. I don't see any difference but what's in our favor. For look here. Say it's election time. I am on the footboard of my cart in the marketplace on a Saturday night. I put up a general miscellaneous lot. I say, now here, my free and independent voters, I'm going to give you such a chance as you never had in all your born days, nor yet the days preceding. Now I'll show you what I am going to do with you, Here's a pair of razors that'll shave you closer than the board of guardians. Here's a flat iron worth its weight in gold. Here's a frying pan artificially flavored with the essence of beefsteaks to that degree that you've only got for the rest of your lives to fry bread and dripping in it. And there you are replete with animal food. 
Here's a genuine chronometer watch in such a solid silver case that you may knock at the door with it when you come home late from a social meeting and rouse your wife and family and save up your knocker for the postman. And here's half a dozen dinner plates that you may play the symbols with to charm baby when it's fractious. Stop, I'll throw in another article, and I'll give you that, and it's a rolling pin. And if the baby can only get it well into his mouth when its teeth has come in and rub the gums once with it, they'll come through double, in a fit of laughter equal to being tickled. Stop again. I'll throw you in another article because I don't like the looks of you, for you haven't the appearance of buyers unless I lose by you, because I'd rather lose than not take money tonight, and that's a looking glass in which you may see how ugly you look when you don't bid. What do you say now? Come! Do you say a pound? Not you, for you haven't got it. Do you say ten shillings? Not you, for you owe more to the tallyman. Well then, I'll tell you what I'll do with you. I'll heap them all on the footboard of the cart. There they are. Razors, flat watch, dinner plates, rolling pin, and away for four shillings, and I'll give you sixpence for your trouble. This is me, the cheap jack. But on the Monday morning, in the same marketplace, comes the dear jack on the hustings, his cart, and what does he say? Now, my free and independent woters, I am going to give you such a chance. He, he begins just like me. As you've never had in all your born days, and that's the chance of signing myself to Parliament. Now I'll tell you what I am going to do for you. Here's interests of this magnificent town promoted above all the rest of the civilized and uncivilized earth. Here's your railways carried and your neighbor's railways jockeyed. Here's all your sons in the post office. Here's Britannia smiling on you. Here's the eyes of Europe on you. Here's universal prosperity for you, repletion of animal food, golden cornfields, gladsome homesteads, and rounds of applause from your own hearts, all in one lot, and that's myself. Will you take me as I stand? You won't? Well then, I'll tell you what I'll do with you. Come now, I'll throw you in anything you ask for. There, church rates... Abolition of mere malt tax, no malt tax, universal education to the highest mark, or universal ignorance to the lowest, total abolition of flogging in the army of a dozen or for every private once a month all round, wrongs of men or rights of women, only say which it shall be, take em or leave em, and I'm of your opinion altogether, and the lot's your own on your own terms. There, you won't take it yet. Well then, I'll tell you what I'll do with you. Come, you are such free and independent voters, and I am so proud of you. You are such a noble and enlightened constituency, and I am so ambitious of the honor and dignity of being your member, which is by far the highest level to which the wings of the human mind can soar, that I'll tell you what I'll do with you. I'll throw you in all the public houses in your magnificent town for nothing. Will that content you? It won't. You won't take the lot yet? Well then, before I put the horse in and drive away, and make the offer to the next most magnificent town that can be discovered, I'll tell you what I'll do. Take the lot, and I'll drop two thousand pound in the streets of your magnificent town for them to pick up that can. Not enough? Look now, look here. This is the very furthest that I'm going to. I'll make it two thousand five hundred. And still you won't? Here, missus, put the horse. No, stop half a moment. I shouldn't like to turn my back upon you neither for a trifle. I'll make it two thousand seven hundred and fifty pound. There, take the lot on your own terms, and I'll count out two thousand seven hundred and fifty pound on the footboard of the cart to be dropped in the streets of your magnificent town for them to pick up that can. What do you say? Come now, you won't do better, and you may do worse. You take it? Hurrah! Sold again, and got the seat. These dear jacks soap the people shameful, but we cheap jacks don't. We tell them the truth about themselves to their faces and scorn to court them. As to wenchersomeness, in the way of puffing up the lots, the dear jacks beat us hollow. It is considered in the cheap jack calling that better patter can be made out of a gun than any article we put up from the cart, except a pair of spectacles. I often hold forth about a gun for a quarter of an hour and feel as if I never need leave off. But when I tell them what the gun can do, and what the gun has brought down, I never go half so far as the dear jacks do when they make speeches in praise of their guns. They're great guns that set em on to do it. Besides, I'm in business for myself. I ain't down into the marketplace to order as they are. Besides, again, my guns don't know what I say in their laudation, and their guns do. And the whole concern of em have reason to be sick and ashamed all round. These are some of my arguments for declaring that the cheap jack calling is treated ill in Great Britain, and for turning warm when I think of the other jacks in question setting themselves up to pretend to look down upon it. I courted my wife, from the footboard of the cart? I did indeed. She was a Suffolk young woman, and it was in Ipswich Marketplace, right opposite the Corn Chandler's shop. 
I noticed her up at a window last Saturday that was appreciating highly. I had took to her, and I had said to myself, if not already disposed of, I'll have that lot. Next Saturday that come, I pitched the cart on the same pitch, and I was in very high feather indeed, keeping him laughing the whole of the time, and getting off the goods briskly. At last I took out of my waistcoat pocket a small lot wrapped in a soft paper, and I put it this way, looking up at the window where she was. Now here, my bloomin' English maidens, is an article, the last article of the present evening sale, which I offer to only you, the lovely Suffolk dumplings billing over with beauty, and I won't take a bit of a thousand pounds, for from any man alive. Now what is it? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's made of fine gold, and it's not broke, though there's a hole in the middle of it, and it's stronger than any fetter that ever was forged, though it's smaller than any finger in my set of ten. Why ten? Because when my parents made over my property to me, I tell you true, there was twelve sheets, twelve towels, twelve tablecloths, twelve knives, twelve forks, twelve tablespoons, and twelve teaspoons, but my set of fingers were too short of a dozen, and could never since be matched. Now what else is it? Come, I'll tell you. It's a hoop of solid gold, wrapped in a silver curl paper, that I myself took off the shiny locks of the ever-beautiful old lady in Threadneedle Street, London City. I wouldn't tell you so if I hadn't the paper to show, or you mightn't believe it even of me. Now what else is it? It's a man-trap in a handcuff, the parish stocks in a leg lock, all in gold and all in one. Now what else is it? It's a wedding ring. Now I'll tell you what I'm going to do with it. I'm not a going to offer this lot for money, but I mean to give it to the next of you beauties that laughs, and I'll pay her a visit tomorrow morning at exactly half after nine o'clock as the chimes go, and I'll take her out for a walk to put up the bands. She laughed and got the ring handed up to her. When I called in the morning, she says, Oh dear, it's never you, and you never mean it. It's ever me, says I, and I am ever yours, and I ever mean it. So we got married, after being put up three times, which, by the by, is quite in the cheap jack way again, and shows once more how the cheap jack customs pervade society. She wasn't a bad wife, but she had a temper. If she could have parted with that one article at a sacrifice, I wouldn't have swapped her away in exchange for any other woman in England. Not that I ever did swap her away, for we lived together till she died, and that was thirteen year. Now, my lords and ladies and gentlefolks all, I'll let you into a secret, though you won't believe it. Thirteen year of temper in a palace would try the worst of you, but thirteen year of temper in a cart would try the best of you. You are kept so very close to it in a cart, you see. There's thousands of couples among you getting on like sweet isle upon a wet stone in houses five and six pairs of stairs high that would go to the divorce court in a cart. Whether the jolting makes it worse, I don't undertake to decide, but in a cart it does come home to you and stick to you. Violence in a cart is so violent, and aggravation in a cart is so aggravating. We might have had such a pleasant life, a roomy cart with the large goods hung outside and the bed slung underneath it when on the road, an iron pot and kettle, a fireplace for the cold weather, a chimney for the smoke, a hanging shelf and a cupboard, a dog and a horse. What more do you want? You draw off upon a bit of turf in a green lane or by the roadside, you hobble your old horse and turn him grazing. You light your fire upon the ashes of the last visitors. You cook your stew, and you wouldn't call the Emperor of France your father. But have a temper in the cart, flinging language and the hardest goods in stock at you. And where are you then? Put a name to your feelings. My dog knew as well when she was on the turn as I did. Before she broke out, he would give a howl and bolt. How he knew it was a mystery to me. But the short and certain knowledge of it would wake him up out of his soundest sleep. And he would give a howl and bolt. At such times I wished I was him. The worst of it was, we had a daughter born to us, and I loved children with all my heart. When she was in her furies, she beat the child. This got to be so shocking, as the child got to be four or five years old, that I have many a time gone on with my whip over my shoulder, at the old horse's head, sobbing and crying worse than ever little Sophie did. For how could I prevent it? Such a thing is not to be tried with such a temper, in a cart without coming to a fight. It's in the natural size and formation of a cart to bring it to a fight, and then the poor child got worse terrified than before, as well as worse hurt generally, and her mother made complaints to the next people we lighted on, and the word went round, Here's a wretch of a cheap jack been of beating his wife. Little Sophie was such a brave child. She grew to be quite devoted to her poor father, 
though he could do so little to help her, so little to help her. She had a wonderful quantity of shining dark hair, all curly and natural about her. It is quite astonishing to me now that I didn't go tearing mad when I used to see her run from her mother before the cart, and her mother catch her by this hair and pull her down by it and beat her. Such a brave child, I said she was. Oh, with reason. Don't you mind next time, father dear, she would whisper to me with her little face still flushed and her bright eyes still wet. If I don't cry out, you may know I am not much hurt. And if I do cry out, it will only be to get mother to let go and leave off. What I have seen the little spirit bear for me without crying out. Yet in other respects, her mother took great care of her. Her clothes were always clean and neat, and her mother was never tired of working at them. Such is the inconsistency in things. Our being down in the marsh country in unhealthy weather, I consider the cause of Sophie's taking bad low fever. But however she took it, once she got it, she turned away from her mother forever more, and nothing would persuade her to be touched by her mother's hand. She would shiver and say, No, 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 when it was offered at, and would hide her face on my shoulder and hold me tighter round the neck. The cheap jack business had been worse than ever I had known it. What with one thing and what with another, at not least with railroads, which will cut it all to pieces, I expect, at last, and I was run dry of money. For which reason, one night, at that period of little Sophie's being so bad, either we must have come to a deadlock for victuals and drink, or I must have pitched the cart as I did. I couldn't get the dear child to lie down or leave go of me, and indeed I hadn't the heart to try, so I stepped out on the footboard with her holding round my neck. They all set up a laugh when they see us, and one chuckle-headed Joskin, that I hated for it, made the bidding, Tuppence for her! Now, you country boobies, says I, feeling as if my heart was a heavy weight at the end of a broken sash line, I give you notice that I am going to charm the money out of your pockets and to give you so much more than your money's worth that you'll only persuade yourselves to draw your Saturday night's wages ever again afterwards by the hopes of meeting me to lay em out with, which you never will, and why not? because I've made my fortunes by selling my goods on a large scale for 75%, less than I give for them, and I am consequently to be elevated to the House of Beers next week by the title of the Duke of Cheap and Marcus Jackaloo Rule. Now let's know what you shall want tonight, and you shall have it. But first of all, shall I tell you why I have got this little girl round my neck? You don't want to know? Then you shall. She belongs to the fairies. She's a fortune teller. She can tell me all about you in a whisper and can put me up to whether you're going to buy a lot or leave it. Now, do you want a saw? No, she says you don't, because you're too clumsy to use one. Else, here's a saw which would be a lifelong blessing to a handyman at four shillings, at three and six, at three, at two and six, at two, at eighteen pence. But none of you shall have it at any price on account of your well-known awkwardness, which would make it manslaughter. The same objection applies to this set of three planes, which I won't let you have neither. So don't bid for him. Now I am a-going to ask her what you do want. Then I whispered, Your head burns so that I am afraid it hurts you bad, my pet. And she answered without opening her heavy eyes, Just a little, father. Oh, this little fortune teller says it's a memorandum book you want. Then why don't you mention it? Here it is. Look at it. Two hundred super fine hot pressed wire wove pages. If you don't believe me, count them. Ready ruled for your expenses, an everlastingly pointed pencil to put em down with, a double bladed pen knife to scratch em out with, a book of printed tables to calculate your income with, and a camp stool to sit down upon while you give your mind to it. Stop, and an umbrella to keep the moon off when you give your mind to it on a pitch dark night. Now I won't ask you how much for the lot, but how little, how little are you thinking of? Don't be ashamed to mention it, because my fortune teller knows already. Then, making believe to whisper, I kissed her and she kissed me. Why, she says you are thinking of as little as three and threepence. I couldn't have believed it, even of you, unless she told me. Three and threepence, and a set of printed tables in the lot that'll calculate your income up to forty thousand a year. With an income of forty thousand a year, you grudge three and sixpence? Well then, I'll tell you my opinion. I so despise the threepence that I'd sooner take three shillings. There, for three shillings, three shillings, three shillings, gone. Hand him over to the lucky man. As there had been no bid at all, and everybody looked about and grinned at everybody, while I touched little Sophie's face and asked her if she felt faint or giddy. Not very, father. It will soon be over. Then turning from the pretty patient eyes, which were open now, and seeing nothing but grins across my lighted grease pot, I went on again in my cheap jack style. Where's the butcher? 
My sorrowful eye had just caught sight of a fat young butcher on the outside of the crowd. She says the good luck is the butcher's. Where is he? Everybody handed on the blushing butcher to the front, and there was a roar, and the butcher felt himself obliged to put his hand in his pocket and take the lot. The party so picked out, in general, does feel obliged to take the lot, good four times out of six. Then we had another lot, the counterpart of that one, and sold at sixpence cheaper, which is always very much enjoyed. Then we had the spectacles. It ain't a special profitable lot, but I put them on, and I see what the Chancellor of the Exchequer is going to take off the taxes, and I see what the sweetheart of the young woman in the shawl is doing at home, and I see what the bishops has got for dinner, and a deal more that seldom fails to fetch him up in their spirits, and the better their spirits, the better their bids. Then we had the ladies' lot, the teapot, tea caddy, glass sugar basin, half a dozen spoons in coddle cup, and all the time I was making similar excuses to give a look or two and say a word or two to my poor child. It was while the second lady's lot was holding them enchained that I felt her lift herself a little on my shoulder to look across the dark street. What troubles you, darling? Nothing troubles me, father. I am not at all troubled. But don't I see a pretty churchyard over there? Yes, my dear. Kiss me twice, dear father, and lay me down to rest upon that churchyard grass so soft and green. I staggered back into the cart with her head dropped on my shoulder, and I says to her mother, Quick, shut the door. Don't let those laughing people see. What's the matter? she cries. Oh, woman, woman, I tells her. You'll never catch my little Sophie by her hair again, for she has flown away from you. Maybe those were harder words than I meant them. But from that time forth, my wife took to brooding, and would sit in the cart or walk beside it, hours at a stretch, with her arms crossed, and her eyes looking on the ground. When her furies took her, which was rather seldomer than before, they took her in a new way, and she banged herself about to that extent that I was forced to hold her. She got none the better for a little drink now and then, and through some years I used to wonder, as I plodded along at the old horse's head, whether there was many carts upon the road that held so much dreariness as mine, for all my being looked up to as the king of the cheap jacks. So sad our lives went on till one summer evening, when, as we were coming into Exeter, out of the farther west of England, we saw a woman beating a child in a cruel manner, who screamed, Don't beat me! Oh, mother, mother, mother! Then my wife stopped her ears and ran away like a wild thing, and next day she was found in the river. Me and my dog were all the company left in the cart now, and the dog learned to give a short bark when they wouldn't bid, and to give another and a nod of his head when I asked him, Who said half a crown? Are you the gentleman, sir, that offered half a crown? He attained to an immense height of popularity, and I shall always believe taught himself entirely out of his own head to growl at any person in the crowd that bid as low as sixpence. But he got to be well on in years, and, and one night when I was convulsing York with the spectacles, he took a convulsion on his own account upon the very footboard by me, and it finished him. Being naturally of a tender turn, I had dreadfully lonely feelings on me after this. I conquered him at selling times, having a reputation to keep, not to mention keeping myself, but they got me down in private and rolled upon me. That's often the way with us public characters. You see us on the footboard and you'd give pretty well anything you possess to be us. See us off the footboard and you'd add a trifle to be off your bargain. It was under those circumstances that I come acquainted with a giant. I might have been too high to fall into conversation with him had it not been my, for my lonely feelings. For the general rule is, going round the country, to draw the line at dressing up. When a man can't trust his getting a living to his undisguised abilities, you consider him below your sort. And this giant, when on view, figured as a Roman. He was a languid young man, which I attribute to the distance betwixt his extremities. He had a little head and less in it. He had weak eyes and weak knees, and altogether you couldn't look at him without feeling that there was greatly too much of him both for his joints and his mind. But he was an amiable, though timid, young man. His mother let him out and spent the money. And we come acquainted when he was walking to ease the horse betwixt two fairs. He was called Rinaldo de Velasco, his name being Pickleson. The giant, otherwise Pickleson, mentioned to me under the seal of confidence that, beyond his being a burden to himself, his life was made a burden to him by the cruelty of his master towards a stepdaughter who is deaf and dumb. Her mother was dead and she had no living soul to take her part, and was used most hard. She traveled with his master's caravan only because there was nowhere else to leave her, and this giant, otherwise Pickleson, 
did go so far as to believe that his master often tried to lose her. He was such a very languid young man that I don't know how long it didn't take him to get the story out, but it passed through his defective circulation to his top extremity in course of time. When I heard this account from the giant, otherwise Pickleson, and likewise that the poor girl had beautiful long dark hair and was often pulled down by it and beaten, I couldn't see the giant through what stood in my eyes. Having wiped him, I gave him sixpence, for he was kept as short as he was long, and he laid it out in two three pennyworths of gin and water, which so brisked him up that he sang the favorite comic of Shivery Shaky, Ain't It Cold, a popular effect which his master had tried every other means to get out of him as a Roman wholly in vain. His master's name was Mim, a wary horse man, and I knew him to speak to. I went to that fair as a mere civilian, leaving the cart outside the town, and I looked upon the back of the vans while the performing was going on, and at last, sitting dozing against the muddy cart wheel, I come upon the poor girl who was deaf and dumb. At the first look I might almost have judged that she had escaped from the wild beast show, but at the second I thought better of her, and thought that if she was more cared for and more kindly used, she would be like my child. She was just the same age that my own daughter would have been if her pretty head had not fell down upon my shoulder that unfortunate night. To cut it short, I spoke confidential to Mim while he was beating the gong outside betwixt two lots of Pickleson's publics, and I put it to him. She lies heavy on your own hands. What do you take for her? Mim was a most ferocious swearer. Suppressing that part of his reply, which was much the longest part, his reply was, A pair of braces. Now I'll tell you, says I, what I'm going to do with you. I'm going to fetch you half a dozen pair of the primest braces in the cart, and then to take her away with me. Says Mim, again ferocious, I'll believe it when I've got the goods, and no sooner. I made all the haste I could, lest he should think twice of it, and the bargain was completed, which Pickleson he was thereby so relieved in his mind that he come out at his little back door, long ways like a serpent, and give us shivery shaky in a whisper among the wheels at parting. It was happy days for both of us when Sophie and me began to travel in the cart. I at once give her the name of Sophie, to put her ever towards me in the attitude of my own daughter. We soon made out to begin to understand one another, through the goodness of the heavens, when she knowed that I meant true and kind by her. In a very little time she was wonderful fond of me. You have no idea what it is to have anybody wonderful fond of you, unless you have been got down and rolled upon by the lonely feelings that I have mentioned as having once got the better of me. You'd have laughed, or the reverse. It's according to your disposition, if you could have seen me trying to teach Sophie. At first I was helped, you never guessed by what, milestones. I got the same large alphabets in a box, all the letters separate on bits of bone, and saying we were going to Windsor, I would give her those letters in that order, and then at every milestone I showed her those same letters in that same order again, and pointed towards the abode of royalty. Another time I gave her cart, and then chucked the same upon the cart. Another time I gave her Dr. Marigold, and hung a corresponding inscription outside my waistcoat. People that met us might stare a bit and laugh, but what did I care? If she caught the idea, she caught it after long patience and trouble. And then we did begin to get on swimmingly, I believe you. At first she was a little given to consider me the cart, and the cart the abode of royalty, but that soon wore off. We had our signs, too, and they was hundreds in number. Sometimes she would sit looking at me and considering hard how to communicate with me about something fresh, how to ask me what she wanted, explained, and then she was, or I thought she was, what does it signify? So like my child with those years added to her, that I half believed it was her, trying to tell me where she had been to up in the skies, and what she had seen since that unhappy night when she flied away. She had a pretty face. And now that there was no one to drag at her bright dark hair, it was all in order. There was a something touching in her looks that made the cart most peaceful and most quiet, though not at all melancholy. In the cheap jack patter, we generally sound it lemon jolly, and it gets a laugh. The way she learnt to understand any look of mine was truly surprising. When I sold of a night, she would sit in the cart unseen by them outside, and would give an eager look into my eyes when I looked in and would hand me straight the precise article or articles I wanted. And then she would clap her hands and laugh for joy. And as for me, seeing her so bright and remembering what she was when I first lighted on her, starved and beaten and ragged, leaning asleep against the muddy cart wheel, 
It gave me such a heart that I gained a greater height of reputation than ever, and I put Pickleson down, by the name of Mim's traveling giant, otherwise Pickleson, for a fippin' note in my will. This happiness went on in the cart till she was sixteen years old, by which time I began to feel not satisfied that I had done my whole duty by her, and to consider that she ought to have better teaching than I could give her. I drew a many tears on both sides when I commenced explaining my views to her, but what's right is right, and you can't neither by tears nor laughter do away with its character. So I took her hand in mine, and I went with her one day to the deaf and dumb establishment in London, and when the gentleman come to speak to us, I says to him, Now I'll tell you what I'll do with you, sir. I am nothing but a cheap jack, but of late years I have laid by for a rainy day notwithstanding. This is my only daughter, adopted, and you can't produce a deafer nor a dumber. Teach her the most that can be taught her and the shortest separation that can be named, state the figure for it, and I am game to put the money down. I won't bait you a single farthing, sir, but I'll put down the money here and now, and I'll thankfully throw you in a pound to take it. There. The gentleman smiled, and then, Well, well, says he, I must first know what she has learned already. How do you communicate with her? Then I showed him, and she wrote in printed writing many names of things and so forth, and we held some sprightly conversation, Sophie and me, about a little story in a book which the gentleman showed her, and which she was able to read. This is most extraordinary, says the gentleman. Is it possible that you have been her only teacher? I have been her only teacher, sir, I says, besides herself. Then, says the gentleman, in more acceptable words was never spoke to me, you're a clever fellow, and a good fellow. This he makes known to Sophie, who kisses his hand, clasps her own, and laughs and cries upon it. We saw the gentleman four times in all, and when he took down my name and asked how in the world it ever chanced to be doctor, it come out that he was own nephew by the sister's side, if you'll believe me, to the very doctor that I was called after. This made our footing still easier, and he says to me, Now, Mary Gold, tell me what more do you want your adopted daughter to know? I want her, sir, to be cut off from the world as little as can be, considering her deprivations, and therefore to be able to read whatever is wrote with perfect ease and pleasure. My good fellow, urges the gentleman, opening his eyes wide, why, I can't do that myself. I took his joke and gave him a laugh, knowing by experience how flat you fall without it, and I mended my words accordingly. What do you mean to do with her afterwards? asked the gentleman, with a sort of doubtful eye. To take her about the country? In the cart, sir, but only in the cart. She will live a private life, you understand, in the cart. I should never think of bringing her infirmities before the public. I wouldn't make a show of her for any money. The gentleman nodded and seemed to approve. Well, he says he, can you part with her for two years? To do her that good? Yes, sir. There's another question, says the gentleman, looking towards her. Can she part with you for two years? I don't know that it was a harder matter of itself, for the other was hard enough for me, but it was harder to get over. However, she was pacified to it at last, and the separation betwixt us was settled. How it cut up both of us when it took place, and when I left her at the door in the dark of an evening, I don't tell. But I know this. Remembering that night, I shall never pass that same establishment without a heartache and a swelling in the throat, and I couldn't put you up the best of lots inside of it with my usual spirit. No, not even the gun, nor the pair of spectacles, for five hundred pound reward from the Secretary of State from the Home Department, and throw in the honor of putting my legs under his mahogany afterwards. Still, the loneliness that followed in the cart was not the old loneliness, because there was a term put to it, however long to look forward to, and because I could think, when I was anyways down, that she belonged to me and I belonged to her. Always planning for her coming back, I bought in a few months' time another cart. And what do you think I plan to do with it? I'll tell you. I plan to fit it up with shelves and books for her reading, and to have a seat in it where I could sit and see her read and think that I had been her first teacher. Not hurrying over the job, I had the fittings knocked together in contriving ways under my own inspection, and here was her bed in a berth with curtains, and there was her reading table, and here was her writing desk, and elsewhere was her books in rows upon rows, pictures in no pictures, bindings in no bindings, gilt-edged and plain, just as I could pick them up for her in lots up and down the country, north and south and west and east, winds like best and winds like least, here and there and gone astray, over the hills and far away. And when I had got together pretty well as many books as the cart would neatly hold, a new scheme came into my head, which, as it turned out, kept my time and attention a good deal employed, and helped me over the two years' style. Without being of an avaricious temper, 
I like to be the owner of things. I shouldn't wish, for instance, to go partners with yourself in the cheap jack cart. It's not that I mistrust you, but that I'd rather know, but that I'd rather know what was mine. Similarly, very likely, you'd rather know what was yours. Well, a kind of jealousy began to creep into my mind when I reflected that all those books would have been read by other people long before they was read by her. It took it seemed to take away from her being the owner of them like it seemed to take away from her being the owner of them like in this way the question got into my head couldn't i have a book new made express for her which she should be the first to read it pleased me that thought did and as i never was a man to let a thought sleep you must wake up all the whole family of thoughts you've got and burn their nightcaps or you won't do it in the cheap jack line i set to work at it Considering that I was in the habit of changing so much about the country, and that I should have to find out a literary character here to make a deal with, and another literary character there to make a deal with, as opportunities presented, I hit on the plan that this same book should be a general miscellaneous lot. Like the razors, flat iron, chronometer watch, dinner plates, rolling pin, and looking glass, it shouldn't be offered as a single individual article like the spectacles or the gun. When I had come to that conclusion, I come to another, which shall likewise be yours. Often had I regretted that she never had heard me on the footboard, and that she never could hear me. It ain't that I am vain, but that you don't like to put your own light under a bushel. bushel. What's the worth of your reputation if you can't convey the reason for it to the person you wish to value it? Now I'll put it to you. Is it worth sixpence, fippence, fourpence, threepence, twopence, a penny, a halfpenny, a farthing? No, it ain't. Not worth a farthing. Very well, then. My conclusion was that I would begin her book with some account of myself so that, through reading a specimen or two of me on the footboard, she might form an idea of my merits there. I was aware that I couldn't do myself justice. A man can't write his eye, or at least I don't know how to, nor yet can a man write his voice, nor the rate of his talk, nor the quickness of his action, nor his general spicy way, but he can write his turns of speech when he is a public speaker, and indeed I have heard that he very often does before he speaks them. Well, having formed that resolution, then come the question of a name. How did I hammer that hot iron into shape? This way. The most difficult explanation I had ever had with her was how I come to be called doctor, and yet was no doctor. After all, I felt that I had failed of getting it correctly into her mind with my utmost pains. But trusting to her improvement in the two years, I thought that I might trust to her understanding it when she should come to read it as put down by my own hand. Then I thought I would try a joke with her and watch how it took, by which of itself I might fully judge of her understanding it. We had first discovered the mistake we had dropped into through her having asked me to prescribe for her when she had supposed me to be a doctor in a medical point of view. So thinks I, now if I give this book the name of my prescriptions, and if she catches the idea that my only prescriptions are for her amusement and interest, to make her laugh in a pleasant way or to make her cry in a pleasant way, it will be a delightful proof to both of us that we have got over our difficulty. It fell out to absolute perfection. For when she saw the book, as I had it got up, the printed and pressed book lying on her desk in her cart, and saw the title, Dr. Marigold's Prescriptions. She looked at me for a moment with astonishment, then fluttered the leaves, then broke out in a laughing in the charmingest way, then felt her pulse and shook her head, then turned the pages pretending to read them most attentive, then kissed the book to me and put it to her bosom with both her hands. I never was better pleased in all my life. But let me not anticipate. I take that expression out of a lot of romances I bought for her. I never opened a single one of them, and I have opened many, but I found the romancer saying, let me not anticipate, which being so, I wonder why he did anticipate, or who asked him to it. Let me not, I say, anticipate. This same book took up all my spare time. It was no play to get the other articles together in the general miscellaneous lot, but when it come to my own article, there, I couldn't have believed the blotting, nor yet the buckling, to it, nor the patient over it, which again is like the footboard. The public have no idea. At last it was done, and the two years' time was gone after all the other time before it. And where it's all gone to, who knows? The new cart was finished, yellow outside, relieved with vermilion and brass fittings. The old horse was put in it, and a new one and a boy being laid on for the cheap jack cart, and I cleaned myself up to go and fetch her. Bright cold weather it was, cart chimney smoking, carts pitched private on a piece of waste ground over at Wandsworth, where you may see them from the southwestern railway when not upon the road. Look out of the right-hand window going down. Marigold, says the gentleman, giving his hand hearty. I am very glad to see you. 
Yet I have my doubts, sir, says I, if you can be half as glad to see me as I am to see you. The time has appeared so long, has it, Marigold? I won't say that, sir, considering its real length, but... What a start, my good fellow. Ah, I should think it was. Grown such a woman, so pretty, so intelligent, so expressive. I knew then that she must be really like my child, or I could never have known her standing quiet by the door. You are affected, says the gentleman in a kindly manner. I feel, sir, says I, that I am but a rough chap in a sleeved waistcoat. I feel, says the gentleman, that it was you who raised her from misery and degradation and brought her into communication with her kind. But why do we converse alone together when we can converse so well with her? Address her in your own way. I am such a rough chap in a sleeved waistcoat, sir, says I, and she is such a graceful woman and she stands so quiet at the door. Try if she moves at the old sign, says the gentleman. They had got it up together a purpose to please me. When I give her the old sign, she rushed to my feet and dropped upon her knees, holding up her hands to me with pouring tears of love and joy. When I took her hands and lifted her, she clasped me round the neck and lay there. And I don't know what a fool I didn't make of myself until we all three settled down into talking without sound, as if there was a something soft and pleasant spread over the whole world for us. So every item of my plan was crowned with success. Our reunited life was more than all that we had looked forward to. Content and joy went with us as the wheels of the two carts went round, and the same stopped with us when the two carts stopped. I was as pleased and as proud as a pug dog with his muzzle black leaded for an evening party, and his tail extra curled by machinery. But I had left something out of my calculations. Now what had I left out? To help you to guess, I'll say a figure. Come, make a guess and guess right. Not, no, nine, no, eight, no, seven, no, six, no, five, no, four, no, three, no, two, no, one, no. Now I'll tell you what I'll do with you. I'll say it's another sort of figure altogether. There. Why then, says you, it's a mortal figure. No, not yet a mortal figure. By such means you got yourself penned into a corner and you can't help guessing an immortal figure. What's, that's about it. Why didn't you say so sooner? Yes, it was an immortal figure that I had altogether left out of my calculations. Neither man's nor woman's, but a child's. Girls or boys? Boys. I, says the sparrow, with my bow and arrow. Now you have got it. We were down at Lancaster, and I had about two nights more than fair average business. Though I cannot, in honor, recommend them as a quick audience. In the open square there, near the end of the street where Mr. Sly's King's Arms and Royal Hotel stands, Mim's traveling giant, otherwise Pickleson, happened at the self same time to be trying it on in the town. The genteel lay was adopted with him. No hint of a van. Green Bay's alcove leading up to Pickleson in an auction room printed poster, free list suspended with the exception of that proud boast of an enlightened country, a free press. Schools admitted by private arrangement. Nothing to raise a blush in the cheek of youth or shock the most fastidious. Mim swearing most horrible and terrific in a pink calico pay place at the slackness of the public. Serious handbill in the shops, importing that it was all but impossible to come to a right understanding of the history of David without seeing Pickleson. I went to the auction room in question, and I found it entirely empty of everything but echoes and moldiness, with the single exception of Pickleson on a piece of red drugget. This suited my purpose, as I wanted a private and confidential word with him, which was, Pickleson, owing much happiness to you, I put you in my will for a fippin' note. But to save trouble, here's four puntin' down, which may equally suit your views, and let us conclude the transaction. Pickleson, who up to that remark had the dejected appearance of a long Roman rushlight that couldn't anyhow get lighted, brightened up at his top extremity, and made his acknowledgments in a way which, for him, was parliamentary eloquence. He likewise did add that, having ceased to draw as a Roman, Mim had made proposals for his going in as a converted Indian giant worked upon by the dairyman's daughter. This, Pickleson, having no acquaintance with the tract named after that young woman, and not being willing to couple gag with his serious views, had declined to do, thereby leading to words in the total stoppage of the unfortunate young man's beer. All of which, during the whole of the interview, was confirmed by the ferocious growling of Mim down below in the pay place, which shook the giant like leaf. But what was to the present point in the remarks of the traveling giant, otherwise Pickleson, was this. Dr. Marigold, 
I give his words without a hope of conveying their feebleness. Who is the strange young man that hangs about your carts? The strange young man? I gives him back, thinking that he meant her, and his languid circulation had dropped a syllable. Doctor, he returned, with a pathos calculated to draw a tear from even a manly eye. I am weak, but not so weak yet as that I don't know my words. I repeat them, doctor. The strange young man. It then appeared to Pickleson, being forced to stretch his legs, not that they wanted it, only at times when he couldn't be seen for nothing, to wit in the dead of the night, and towards daybreak, had twice seen hanging about my carts, in the same town of Lancaster, where I had been only two nights, the same unknown young man. It put me rather out of sorts. What it meant as to particulars I no more foreboded than you forebode now, but it put me rather out of sorts. Howsoever, I made light of it to Pickleson, and I took leave of Pickleson, advising him to spend his legacy in getting up his stamina, and to continue to stand by his religion. Towards morning, I kept a lookout for the strange young man, and, what was more, I saw the strange young man. He was well-dressed and well-looking, he loitered very nigh my carts, watching them like as if he was taking care of them, and soon after daybreak turned and went away. I sent a hail after him, but he never started or looked round, or took the smallest notice. We left Lancaster within an hour or two, on our way toward Carlisle. Next morning at daybreak I looked out again for the strange young man. I did not see him, but next morning I looked out again, and there he was once more. I sent another hail after him, but as before he gave not the slightest sign of being anyways disturbed. This put a thought into my head. Acting on it, I watched him in different manners, and at different times, not necessary to enter into, till I found that this strange young man was deaf and dumb. The discovery turned me over, because I knew that a part of that establishment where she had been was allotted to young men, some of them well off, and I thought to myself, if she favors him, where am I? And where is all that I have worked and planned for? Hoping, I must confess to the selfishness, that she might not favor him, I set myself to find out. At last I was by accident present at a meeting between them in the open air, looking on leaning behind a fir tree without their knowing of it. It was a moving meeting for all the three parties concerned. I knew every syllable that passed between them as well as they did. I listened with my eyes, which had come to be as quick and true with deaf and dumb conversation as my ears with the talk of people that can speak. He was going out to China as clerk in a merchant's house, which his father had before him. He was in circumstances to keep a wife, and he wanted her to marry him and go along with him. She persisted, no. He asked if she didn't love him. Yes, she loved him, dearly dearly, but she could never disappoint her beloved, good, noble, generous, and I don't know what all father, meaning me, the cheap jack in the sleeved waistcoat, and she would stay with him, heaven bless him, though it was to break her heart. Then she cried most bitterly, and that made up my mind. While my mind had been in an unsettled state about her favoring this young man, I had felt that unreasonable towards Pickleson, that it was well for him he had got his legacy down, for I often thought, if it hadn't been for this same weak-minded giant, I might never have come to trouble my head and wex my soul with about the young man. But once that I knew she loved him, once that I had seen her weep for him, it was a different thing. It made it right in my mind with Pickleson on the spot, and I shook myself together to do what was right by all. She had left the young man by that time, for it took a few minutes to get me thoroughly well shook together, and the young man was leaning against another of the fir trees, of which there was a cluster with his face upon his arm. I touched him on the back. Looking up and seeing me, he says in our deaf and dumb talk, Do not be angry. I am not angry, good boy. I am your friend. Come with me. I left him at the foot of the steps of the library cart, and I went up alone. She was drying her eyes. You have been crying, my dear. Yes, father. Why? A headache. Not a heartache? I said a headache, father. Dr. Marigold must prescribe for that headache. She took up the book of my prescriptions and held it up with a forced smile, but seeing me keep still and look earnest, she softly laid it down again, and her eyes were very attentive. The prescription is not there, Sophie. Where is it? Here, my dear. I brought her young husband in, and I put her hand in his, and my only father words to both of them were these, Dr. Marigold's last prescription, to be taken for life after which I bolted. When the wedding come off, I mounted a coat, blue and bright buttons, for the first and last time in all my days, and I give Sophie away with my own hand. There were only us three and the gentleman who had charge of her for th those two years. I give the wedding dinner of four in the library cart, 
pigeon pie, a leg of pickled pork, a pair of fowls, and suitable garden stuff. The best of drinks. I give them a speech, and the gentleman gives us a speech, and all our jokes told, and the whole went off like a skyrocket. In the course of the entertainment, I explained to Sophie that I should keep the library cart as my living cart, when not upon the road, and that I should keep all her books for her just as they stood, till she come back to claim them. She went to China with her young husband, and it was a parting sorrowful and heavy, and I got the boy I had another service, and so as of old, when my child and wife were gone, I went plodding along alone, with my whip over my shoulder, at the old horse's head. Sophie wrote me many letters, and I wrote her many letters. About the end of the first year, she sent me one in an unsteady hand. Dearest father, not a week ago I had a darling little daughter, but I am so well that they let me write these words to you. Dearest and best father, I hope my child may not be deaf and dumb, but I do not yet know. When I wrote back, I hinted the question. But as Sophie never answered that question, I felt it to be a sad one, and I never repeated it. For a long time, our letters were regular, but then they got irregular, through Sophie's husband being moved to another station, and through my being always on the move. But we were in one another's thoughts, I was equally sure. Letters or no letters. Five years, odd months, had gone since Sophie went away. I was still the king of the cheap jacks, and at a greater height of popularity than ever. I had had a first-rate autumn of it, and on the 23rd of December, 1864, I found myself at Uxbridge, Middlesex, clean sold out. So I jogged up to London with the old horse, light and easy, to have my Christmas Eve and Christmas Day alone by the fire in the library cart, and then to buy a regular new stock of goods all round to sell them again and get the money. I am a neat hand at cookery, and I'll tell you what I knocked up for my Christmas Eve dinner in the library cart. I knocked up a beefsteak pudding for one with two kidneys, a dozen oysters, and a couple of mushrooms thrown in. It's a pudding to put a man in good humor with everything except the two bottom buttons of his waistcoat. Having relished that pudding and cleared away, I turned the lamp low and sat down by the light of the fire, watching it as it shone upon the backs of Sophie's books. Sophie's books so brought Sophie's self that I saw her touching face quite plainly before I dropped off dozing by the fire. This may be a reason why Sophie, with her deaf and dumb child in her arms, seemed to stand silent by me all through my nap. I was on the road, off the road, in all sorts of places, north and south and east and west, winds liked best and winds liked least, here and there and gone astray, over the hills and far away, and still she stood silent by me with her silent child in her arms. Even when I woke with a start, she seemed to vanish, as if she had stood by me in that very place only a single instant before. I had started at a real sound, and the sound was on the steps of the cart. It was the light, hurried tread of a child, coming clamoring up. The tread of a child had once been so familiar to me that for half a moment I believed I was going to see a little ghost. But the touch of a real child was laid upon the outer handle of the door, the handle turned, and the door opened a little way, and a real child peeped in. A bright little comely girl with large dark eyes. Looking full at me, the tiny creature took off her mite of a straw hat, and a quantity of dark curls fell about her face. Then she opened her lips and said in a pretty voice, Grandfather! Oh, my God! I cries out. She can speak! Yes, dear grandfather, and I am to ask you whether there was ever anyone that I remind you of. In a moment, Sophie was round my neck, as well as the child, and her husband was a ring in my hand with his face hid, and we all had to shake ourselves together before we could get over it. And when we did begin to get over it, and I saw the pretty child a-talking, pleased and quick and eager and busy, to her mother, and the signs that I had first taught her mother, the happy and yet pitying tears fell rolling down my face. And that was the story. So what did you think of it? Now, some aspects of the story I know doesn't age well, um, especially using terms like dumb to describe somebody who cannot communicate. When we look back at this story, we have to put it in its context of when it's being written. And pretty much most of the people that time just wanted to write, write these people off and say they were, had no value, they were worthless, they were damaged in some way, so they had no value to society. And Dickens, of course, is wanting to bring light to that 
to their plight, to their story and say, no, look, care about these people. Look at what they go through. Look what they can learn. They are capable of learning and communicating and producing a family just like we are. There's there's a lot in that too. But uh, like I said, I, I, I don't want to get into it yet. I just want you to enjoy the story today. And uh, coming up in the next episode, as we begin season three, I'm going, uh, we're going to talk about that story a little bit more, and I'll have a special guest on to talk about what we're reading for December, for January, and as well as some lots of great Christmas fun to come as we begin the long countdown to Christmas of 2022. Until I'm back, remember that there is nothing in the world more irresistibly contagious than laughter and good humor. Have a very Merry Christmas.